طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وموالا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Well, this is Anfi You all know me but I don't Walaikum know Walaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Shia How's everybody online as well? MashaAllah Alhamdulillah It's a bit of a weird experience. Normally I walk into a class and it's either we have to do introductions and everybody has to get to know everybody else. I feel like on the back foot, yeah? And it feels a bit ridiculous also to expect introductions now because you've been uh, sort of getting lessons for a while. Inshallah, let's see how this goes. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم this class we doing uh, surah at-talaq right and surah at-talaq is going to be new for those of you who just joined this class can i get a show of hands just to see How many of you are new to the class? One, two. Irshad, you know, weren't you part of this class? Oh, I see. Okay. So it's one, two, yourself as well, three, four, five. Anybody else? Okay. So the rest of you are all old. Um, so for those of you who are, are newly joined in this class, um, Where do we begin? You've received the previous lessons. I don't suppose you managed to get over those lessons. Okay, so you need a brief intro. For those of you who have been here, which ayah did we, did we last cover? It's been a while also. The third ayah, sure, I think. Okay, we've got uh, the third ayah here. Everybody agree with that? Fine. So for those of you who are new, inshallah, just a quick overview. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Surah Al-Talaq, the chapter about Al-Talaq, uh, the divorce. It's a very, it's a beautiful chapter for many reasons. Uh, it makes it unique, as with all chapters of the Quran. But this one is unique um, in, in light of our lessons, because number one, it is a Madani surah, as opposed to a Makki surah. And being a Madani surah, it has unique features that make it Madani or that uh, are peculiar or particular specific to Madani surah. It is a chapter containing lessons that one wouldn't necessarily associate with talaq, which I believe to be very important because if there's one thing that has many misconceptions, that has many issues around it, you know, It would be talaq. And the wisdom of the Quran also shines through, <coughs> also shines through in light of this because you don't find a chapter in the Quran called uh, the chapter of salah. Right? You don't find that. But you find kitab uh, al-talaq, kitab al-talaq, surah al-talaq. And another, another outstanding uh, segment of verses as opposed to a chapter is the segment in the Quran speaking about inheritance, mirath. You don't find the details of salah, but you find the details of mirath. And it often, it often eludes people because the average Muslim, somebody who, who lives as a Muslim today, but doesn't necessarily have access to the Arabic of the Quran, would easily assume that um, that you would find the details of salah in the Quran. That if you open up the Quran, you're going to be able to find everything about Islam therein, right? But that's not the case. The Quran works hand in hand with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the Quran often provides us with the basis, whereas the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi wa provides us with the details. But there are certain occasions in which the Quran provides us with the details. And then it, it's, it's a bit of a weird experience because it's unusual for the Quran. And then we have to ask, so why? Why provide details of so some things and then other things not so much? But this is divine wisdom. This is divine wisdom. 
We don't find families being split up and relationships breaking down and the cutting of family ties because of salah. It's the most important act of ibadah. We all agree on that. But you don't find people breaking family ties because of salah. Astaghfirullah, how could you make Allah Akbar like this? I'm not your brother anymore. You don't find that. But when it comes to talaq, when it comes to mirat, you, you find that. So it makes perfect sense. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then uh, some of the verses that make the surah interesting from the outset that one wouldn't necessarily expect to find in surah to talaq is um, the verses that you often quote about tawakkul. I'm just going to go, well, that's surah Fatiha. Some of these you would have heard being quoted before, certainly. وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Or let me just go to وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ You find these verses in Surah Al-Talaq, which is interesting because there, there are three verses about taqwa and tawakkul that seemingly doesn't have anything to do with talaq, but it's in Surah to talaq and it certainly comes within that context. And this gives us an idea of what the Surah is trying to achieve as far as the reader is concerned. It's, it's reconditioning the way we think. And this is a very important, this is a very important function of the Quran is that the Quran programs us. That's the idea, right? It's supposed to become part of your blood, your bones, your muscles. And when I say that, I'm using that metaphorically. It's supposed to become part of the way we think. And it does that. Wallahi, it does that. I don't know if it, if it did that for you yet, but what I can say is you need to emerge, immerse yourself into the Quran. When you immerse yourself into the Quran, that means you spend an incredible amount of time with the Quran consistently. And then thereafter you will find that your way of thinking changes i don't know how it happens i don't know when exactly it happens but it happens right and all that is required from your side is to give it its due right so that means spending time with it daily immer immersing yourself therein and allowing yourself to be taken on the journey with the quran and then you wake up one morning and you start noticing things are different I'm not saying it happens overnight, like at once, but there is a point at which you realize you're no longer thinking the way you used to think, and you're no longer speaking the way you used to speak. I'm not saying you become perfect, it's just a process begins, and that process is a reconditioning. So you have an idea as to what talaq is because of the home you come from, your experiences in life, the society in which you live, the culture that you've been brought up with. And then you go to the Quran and you come to learn about a completely different perspective. Perhaps some things you knew about before, perhaps some things you did not. You engage in the Quran, you immerse yourself into it, and you start thinking about things differently. Where talaq in society may be looked at as a calamity, as, a, as an evil, right? Maybe even a necessary evil, but an evil nonetheless. Then you come to the Quran and you see, oh, this looks different. Ya ayyu an nabi starts. Ida talakutum un nisa afatalikuhunna li idatihinna. When you divorce your wives, then divorce them in a specific period. Thinking, but this is a very different tone to the way talak is normally discussed. Wa ahsul idda and count the idda. All your life you could have been hearing about. Uh, the importance of idda, and you come to hear about this is a rule of idda, that's a rule of idda, lady can't do this, lady can't. So you think about it in a certain way. I found this to be quite uh, a frequent um, experience where you see fiqh in a particular light, and that's no, no fault of your own. It's just the nature of taking these uh, organic laws and then turning them into a purely legal discourse 
which is what we do in fiqh. In fiqh, you don't get to hear about, Ya ayyuhu al-Nabi, Iza talaqtum al-Nisa'a. You hear, talaq is this, this is the definition, this is the rules, this is the, the number of months that you have to be in idda. This these are the rules of idda. This is what you can do, what you can't do. So it's a very cold approach, right? Because it's it's a book of law, it's legal information. And the Quran has that same information, but not with the legal spirit, rather in the Quranic spirit, in what makes Quran Quran. So then you think about things differently. Now talaq is no longer this evil thing, because the way Allah speaks about it is far from being an evil thing. Um, for example, لا تخرجوهن من بيوتهن. Do not expel them from their homes. It's very different to a woman is not allowed to leave the home except for, do you understand what I'm saying? It's very different. And that's the Quran. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with fiqh, absolutely not. It's, it's, it serves its purpose. What is that purpose? To tell us what the rules are, the do's and the don'ts. But what happens with a limited approach to your Islamic studies is that you limit the way you think as well. So you go to Islam via fiqh alone, then that's the, 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 the packaging that you'll receive and that's where you'll stop. And unfortunately, this is the case for many people. Um, I don't know how things are anymore, but I remember growing up, if you wanted to go and learn generally, you'll join a fiqh class. That's your first point of call. I think things are a bit different now. There's so many different types of courses available. But I don't think that's necessarily the best approach. And why is that? Because we are dealing with a surah that is madani. Okay? And this is a breakdown of the Quran's periods of revelation. It was the Makki period and the madani period, and things were very different between them. But while they, were, they are different in terms of context, they are also different in terms of the conditioning that the recipients of the Quran had gone through. 13 years, no laws, just building up of taqwa. And then 10 years of ahkam, laws. But also in the same time, it is laws em embellished with the spirit of the Quran, the word of Allah, speech of Allah. So there's a process of development that that person had gone through. Uh, a typical example would be Khamar. Khamar was not prohibited in one shot. I think that would have been a colossal failure because of how entrenched Khamar is in society even today. But Islam was successful in uprooting the culture of Khamar entirely. That is uh, the magic of the Quran, the barakah of the Quran. Had it been that first day you know, khamr is haram for you. You cannot drink it, stay away from it entirely. Perhaps it would be too much for people. So in light of that, if, a, if, an, if an average person, perhaps born Muslim, perhaps not, but they you know, eventually really embrace Islam, start making salah right now, I need to learn about my deen into a fiqh class. It may just be the, the wrong approach. Even though all of those laws are applicable to the person, it may just be the wrong approach. And this is why people sometimes find uh, the laws of Islam to be difficult. They come to the Quran, or sorry, they come to a fiqh class and they come to, this is haram, that is haram. So sure, everything is haram, you know? That's the feeling that some people might walk away with. But the Quran does things uh, somewhat differently, where it gently persuades you to a point where you yourself find something detestable, or you yourself develop a certain attitude towards something that the Quran wants you to, to have. So back to talaq. Talaq is not evil. Talaq is not sinful. Talaq is not haram. As opposed to what we think and what we believe. Talaq is a very necessary thing. Now, yes, it is abghadul halali and Allah. It is the most detested halal thing by Allah. But often people focus upon the detested part and ignore or completely overlook the halal part. It is still halal. 
And I think this is extremely important because if you were to understand what evil can come from a marriage in which there is no upholding of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you would know that talaq is way better under certain circumstances. And the Quran gives us clear lines as to when that is the case. When should a couple call it quits? And when should they work at their marriage? As opposed to what society wants us to think. Society wants us to think, under no circumstances should you get divorced. Work it out, stick it through. Okay, he's just hitting you a couple of times, just take it. You know, be paying, have sabr, make dua. That's wrong. Okay. If a person with another person cannot uphold the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with one another, they cannot find peace with each other. At least they, not peace necessarily, but they cannot find mutual respect with the laws of Allah ta'ala in, in relation to one another, then perhaps it would be better for them to part ways. Oh no, but what about the children? They're going to become delinquents and all of these things. Again, don't allow societal norms or societal misnomers to creep into Islam, right? Uh, there's a book, I don't know if I spoke to you about it before, but there's a book that beautifully shows us how normal and how, um, yeah, let me leave it at normal, how normal talaq was in early Islamic civilization, early Islamic society, without all of the, the misconceptions around it. Today, yeah, somebody's a divorcee, then it's almost like already you're starting to ask questions. Why? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? What did they do? Why couldn't, why didn't it work out? You know, why couldn't she keep her husband? And that's the type of notions we need to get rid of. I, I believe Kitab al-Talaq is quite key in regards to this. So we managed to get up into verse number three, according to the students in this class. Mashallah, let's see where that begins. يا أيها النبي إذا إذا طلقتم النساء فطلقوهن لعدتهن وأحصل العدة واتقوا الله ربكم لا تخرجوهن من بيوتهن ولا يخرجن إلا أن يأتين بفاحشة مبينة وتلك حدود الله ومن يتعد حدود الله فقد ظلم نفسه That's another one that I emphasized quite a bit on before when when people who have not been immersed in the quran speak about the laws of allah it often it often shows in oversimplification of things people would say things like but allah is ghafur rahim you know that's merciful it's okay don't worry about it so you will simplify something as important as idda tala and just say but Allah is most merciful, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about these Idda stuff. It doesn't make sense these days. That's the type of speech you might hear. I heard this myself in the only years. I was quite shocked um, when I heard somebody saying, not to me, but dear me, about how, uh, look, I don't remember the exact words, but it came down to how draconic and how archaic these laws are, this Idda stuff. I mean, come on, we're living in a different society. Not understanding the law at all, but would be being willing to dismiss it simply because it doesn't, uh, it's not congruent with what they find to be palatable, what they find to be acceptable. But when Allah speaks about it, is it's very different. And whosoever transgresses the boundaries of Allah, such a person has committed zulm, oppression. To who? To themselves. We don't understand the divine wisdom necessarily, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any divine wisdom. Find the divine wisdom if you need to, if that will help you. But most importantly, don't overstep the boundaries of Allah. Yes, Allah is the Khafur Rahim. Yes, Islam is merciful and all of those magical things. But there are boundaries for a reason. لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمرا. This is another one that we, we spoke about at length. You don't know, perhaps Allah will cause something to happen thereafter. That's very important. 
I've, I've spoken to so many women who felt the need to leave their marriage, right? But because of how society operates and because of the position that they find themselves in, depending on their husband, perhaps for financial support, number one, that's fine, that's normal. But more importantly, thinking about all of the misconceptions and societal um, stigmas attached to Tala, then they imprison themselves in a marriage that they really shouldn't be in. So now it's, if I leave him, who will get married to me? I'm already 40 years of age. I'm, I'm already uh, sitting with three kids, right? Uh, I don't work. I, I depend on my husband. I, I must not tolerate him, okay? That becomes very problematic, especially when he knows it, when he knows it. So now it becomes like, you are desperate. I'm not desperate. I can leave you at any time. You have to be here with me, sir. I'm going to push the boundaries of what you have to tolerate. This is a very, very common thing. And it, it's a very evil thing as well. And it's oppression from the side of the man, if that is the case of what he's doing. But yeah, Allah says it in a very different way. Perhaps Allah will cause something to happen thereafter. This often happens not, okay, it's not specific to Tala, happens in life. So many people have an amazing dream that they wish to pursue in terms of their job, in terms of their career. But they don't want to let go of this full-time job because it's a sense of security, right? At the end of the month, I'm going to get my salary, so I'll be fine. If I'm going to cut myself off from that and have to fend for myself, I don't know what's waiting on the other side. So I'm going to stick to this full-time job that I despise anyways. And I've got this, um, this amazing plan on the other side, but I'm too afraid to get there. You know? And then they keep on just putting it off one day, one day, one day, under the false pretenses of security. Because that type of security isn't security, really. Right? It may seem like security on paper, but at the end of the day, it's just another matter that's under the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's where tawakkul really comes in. When you have a plan and you know what to do and you can do it, all you have to then do is cut the rope and do it. So it's not specific to marriage and we can actually extend the lessons further in this particular part of the verse. You don't know. It's like a verse you can write in gold. You don't know, perhaps Allah will cause something, some matter to come after this, right? And it's a, very, it's a very easy lesson to speak about, very, very difficult lesson to put into practice because you have to cut the rope, right? You heard the story about the man who didn't cut the rope? Sound familiar to anybody? Okay, story time. <laughs> there was a man Apparently, it's a biblical story. I don't know, but it's a nice story nonetheless. It is a, there was a man who was climbing a mountain, uh, like proper mountain climbing where they have these ropes and, you know, they, they have to put in a pig and then they go a bit further, put in another pig. So this man goes up and as he's coming down from the mountainside, he gets stuck. It's nighttime now. It's dark. He can't come any further and he can't also go back up. So he's just stuck there. And the man starts praying. And he says, uh, in whichever language he spoke, oh God, I need your help. Please get me out of this situation. And he hears a voice. And the voice says, cut the rope. And he's like, what? <laughs> I'm hanging from the side of a mountain. I can't see beneath me. How is that the solution he's thinking? So he then prays on and he prays on and he prays on. And every time he gets the answer, cut the rope, cut the rope, cut the rope. Anyways, he didn't listen. And they found his body hanging the next morning, one meter off of the ground. All he needed to do was cut the rope and walk away. So that lesson uh, is somewhat inclusive in here. That's tawakkul. Right? You, you ask Allah for a solution. 
Allah will give you a solution, but often what is required is that you take a step or a leap of faith, as they call it. That's often what is required. Allah works like that. I've seen the Wallahi Al-Azim, I've seen this so many times in my own life. I've seen it in crazy times. Um, like I've never been, alhamdulillah, I've never been afraid of walking away from one job to another, even, even when it looks as though it's, a, it's an insane move. Like normally, you're supposed to only do that when you, when you know where else you're going, right? I've done that on more than one occasion where I had no idea where to next, just knowing that I'm going to do something. It's not like I'm going to sit at home and uh, wait for something to happen. But there's a reason why I need to leave this job. If there's a legitimate reason why I need to leave something, then even if I don't know where I'm going to, as long as I'm going to make the effort, because that's a necessary point of tawakkul. Tawakkul is not just cut the rope and do nothing. It's cut the rope and do something. We sometimes believe that that thing must be well-defined, clearly laid out, etc., etc. Then you do it. You know That's not tawakkul. Tawakkul is the bird goes out in the morning and comes back with a full belly. That bird has no clue where it is going to find food. But it's going to leave the nest and it's going to go and find, it's going to go and search. The result is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a lesson that we learned from the surah as well. The second verse we went, فَإِذَا بَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ فَأَمْسِكُوهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ فَارِقُوهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفٍ We spoke about the nature of how you should either stay with your wife, with your husband, Ma'ruf, and we spoke about the word ma'ruf and what it means. Arafa ya'rifu ma'ruf is from the word to know. And then ma'ruf is on ismul maf'ul. Ma'ruf maf'ul, which is that which is known. What? That which is known to be good between the two of them. Because it's different for every couple. So there's no set of how a couple should live with one another in detail. But as a basic principle, they should live with one another in a way that mutually is considered to be good between the two of them. So that's ma'aruf. So you either live together in ma'aruf, or if you cannot, then depart or part ways in the same spirit. There's the first one. Whosoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will make a way out for that person. Uh, just in case you don't know what I'm doing, I'm trying to give like a synopsis, overview, review for the new students, inshallah, right? So that's a verse that we often hear quoted. Whosoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will make a way out for that person. I think when we hear this verse, it seems on surface level and possibly easy when that if you have taqwa, if you have Allah consciousness, then, then Allah will sort you out only. That's the impression that one gets from the verse at the, at the superficial glance. But now I ask the question, does this then mean that if you don't have taqwa of Allah, that Allah will not make a way out for you? And that's what the verse is, isn't it? It's the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't necessarily have the required taqwa, but yet Allah is still there for you. He still gives you the risk. He still gives you the way out. He still saves you on countless occasions. Those who have taqwa of him and those who don't. So then what meaning is there in the verse now? Then I ask the other question, right? So let's say you have taqwa. Does he always make a way out for you in the way that you understand to be a way out? So then what meaning is in the verse now? What says the muftis? You must have taqwa at all times, yes. But what meaning do you then get from the verse if you know intrinsically that both is true, even if you don't have taqwa, Allah can still and often does make a way out for you. That's number one. And number two, it's not that if you have taqwa, 
then you will always get the outcome that you want. So what does that amount to? Yeah, we have somebody online saying makes us content with the outcome. That's one way of looking at it, yes? Sabr? Anybody else? Think about it in practical terms, in your own life. How would this, what would this mean for you? If you have taqwa of Allah, Allah will make a way out for you. You must keep striving in, in, in a direction uh, to get some guidance. And eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get a way out for you. Yeah, I mean, that's, we, Fikran, we've got that. So my, my question again is, that doesn't then preclude the other options. So if you don't have taqwa, you don't strive, Allah saves us all the time, right? We can be like the worst of the worst people, find ourselves in situations, and then Allah magically takes us out of it. And then, you know, retrospectively, we say, alhamdulillah, but then we go back to our evil ways anyway. And then on the other hand, we also have taqwa. I mean, you, I'm sure you know that there are some people who have an amazing relationship with Allah, but then the outcome that they believe to be the right one or that they believe to be the good one, they don't actually get that outcome. Right? Maybe they get a, uh, an outcome, a suitable outcome, a good outcome, but not the one that they thought. So th this is one perspective. This is one perspective. In relation to that person who has taqwa, it's like a person who's sitting in a room with the contentment that there's an exit, there's a fire escape. I'm thinking about it in light of that. You're with me. One person is in a jail cell. It's locked. There's no way out. That's how that, I mean, if that is your situation, what is your psychological state? That the person in jail, I mean, come on. He's imprisoned, okay? But the person who has taqwa, he may be in a cell, but he has a key, so he can leave whenever he wants. He's not imprisoned in that state. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the person in the jail is not necessarily in a jail. Somebody can still come and unlock the door and, and he can leave. But he doesn't feel that way. He doesn't have a makhraj. What is makhraj in, in English? An exit. So he doesn't see an exit. He doesn't feel like there's an exit. He feels like a prisoner. But the one who has taqwa may be in the same situation. But in his heart, in his soul, in his life, he knows there's a makhraj, there's an exit. And they live very different lives. The outcomes may be exactly the same as we said. Person who has taqwa may be saved in a way. And the person who doesn't have taqwa may also be saved in the same way. They could even be involved, now the billah Allah predict this, but they could even be involved in the same car accident. Right? Two people sitting in uh, two vehicles or even one vehicle, they meet up with an accident. One has taqwa, one doesn't have taqwa. In that moment as the collision is happening, the one has taqwa coming forth and the other one doesn't. The one says, Inna lillah. And then and the other one says, oh, yara. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you know. But what I'm saying is for, for both of them in the vehicles, the one, the psychological state is that of somebody who has an exit. My exit is always there. I always have Allah. And the other one doesn't have anything, doesn't have anyone. Or even worse, they only have themselves. And that's like nothing. Like the person in the jail cell, I've still got me. So what? You're stuck in the jail cell. <laughs> You've got nothing, you know? But the person who has Allah, you can't, you can't imprison them. You can't tie them down because they are not uh, imprisoned. Does that make sense? 
I think it's important because we sometimes utilize uh, verses in a particular understanding always, and then it kind of sticks to that meaning, but we don't actually consider the other truths that we already know. Like we know that Allah isn't only there for people who have taqwa, He's there for people who don't have taqwa as well, right? Like there's this, this hadith of the Prophet Those who know Allah in times of ease, Allah will know you in times of difficulty. But what about if you didn't know Allah in times of ease? Will he not know you in times of difficulty? Allah, Allah is still there for you. So what does it mean? A similar type of thing, right? And Allah knows best. So a person sitting in, uh, is it not a test from Allah to help us build taqwa? Absolutely, yes. All of, all of what you said is correct. I just wanted to kind of uh, navigate that. And then finally, the, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, the, the issue of talaq again, right? For a couple, and I'm, I'm going to use the, the example of the woman a lot because they are often finding themselves in the position of being the oppressed, not the oppressor. Yes, some of them are beating their husbands up as well in society. That happens as well. But for a lady who knows that she has Allah, will always know that there's an exit. But for the lady who's struggling with that concept, she feels like, how can I leave him? How? How can I leave him? You know, give me a couple of blue eyes, but how can I leave him? You know, he said he's going to kill me tonight, but how can I leave him? Don't you know you have an exit? Allah knows best. And then lastly, I see the time is up. I don't, I'm still kind of get used to how things work in person where I don't know the periods and things like that. So forgive me if I'm, uh, if I'm not following the usual tartib. The last one, If I trust upon Allah, Allah is enough for that person. إن الله باله أمر الله وقوز يز كمان تكام تباس قد جعل الله لكل شيء قدرا and Allah has made قدر as in قضاء and قدر for everything so there's a really a decree do you see how this this surah is really getting into the psychology of the person who's finding themselves in a situation of divorce there are profound lessons they are in for uh, for that type of situation but not only for that situation which is why you would hear these verses often quoted, not even remotely close to uh, something about talaq. Because it applies to other situations in life. Wherever you feel as though you don't know if you can get out of a situation, but you know that you also kind of should, and you, you find that conflict happening, read Surah Al-Talaq, inshallah ta'ala. I pray that this was a, uh, a good overview for those of you who, are, who have just joined. And a good review for those of you who had been here. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't do anything new. Well, we kind of got some new perspectives on things that we've already covered. Uh, inshallah, next time we start from here. The women who no longer experience, experience menses, meaning postmenopausal, and what they need to do in the case of Idda and so on, and some of the lessons that we can draw from that. Are there any questions before I uh, before I go? I believe there's a nikah also now sometimes.